My name is Chad Altman. I'm a associate partner at Bellwether Education Partners. We're a pull it away from that. Uh, that's my slide. <laughs> <laughs> Under the table. Uh, so <laughs> Bellwether, yeah, that's totally good. Uh, Bellwether Education Partners, we're a strategic advising, policy and thought leadership and talent development uh, nonprofit based here in DC. Uh, I happen to edit one of our initiatives. It's a website that we run called teacherpensions.org, where we try to uh, create a resource list about pensions and inform the public about any new research or other things that are going on in the pension world. We take a, a slice of the pension and retirement world. We look particularly at teacher pensions. And so uh, my talk is going to be about that. There's a lot of overlap with other uh, pension issues. And uh, I'm happy to talk about other retirement issues. But most of what I'm talking about is directed particularly at and teachers. Is that better? Yeah. OK. Uh, so. so crisis is a big, scary word. Uh, and I, I'm not ready to say that everywhere is a crisis. I will say that the plans necessarily aren't working for themselves, or aren't working for their members very well. Um, and so I'm going to talk about how that, that is or is not taking place across the country. The first thing uh, I want to note is just how this impacts different people at different levels. So the state legislators, what you hear in the media is usually about these big numbers. We have large unfunding liabilities with lots of zeros behind them. And so states react to those. And they, they make changes to their plans. They tinker with different formulas. And they uh, impact workers. That trickles down to uh, schools and districts in terms of how much the contributions are facing and how district budgets are affected. And uh, at the bottom line, for teachers, they pay the ultimate costs. They have lower base salaries because of rising contribution rates, and they have poor retirement security because of the way the pension plans are structured. Um, so first, I want to make a point that funding levels vary. So uh, how you look at this depends a lot on where you sit. If you sit in New Jersey or Illinois, uh, or Detroit, you might look at pensions very differently than if you sat in Wisconsin or New York. Uh, but there are some issues that are, are consistent across them. This is from the National Association of State Retirement Administrators uh, looking at planned funding across a 20-year landscape. What you could see is that as of 2000, at the end of the retirement, or the end of the internet boom in the late 1990s, plans were 100% funded on average across the country. Uh, that, that ratio has fallen as uh, plans and states have underfunded and as they had two recessions, and that uh, as of the most current data, it's still falling. So we haven't recovered from the recession despite changes. Um, in response to the recession, nearly every state made changes. They increased their contribution rates. They increased their retirement ages. They um, made vesting more difficult, so made it harder for teachers to qualify for a pension at all. And they made them less generous overall, particularly for new teachers. They also, for existing retirees, they cut uh, cost of living adjustments across the country. Uh, cost of living adjustments are either ad hoc. Some states made changes to how they adjust over time to inflation, which are hitting current retirees because of the funding levels. We have a forthcoming paper looking at how these changes have impacted the teacher workforce <coughs> over time. And as of today, new workers as of 2012 and going forward are actually having worse retirement plans than any time in the last 30 years. And it's all because of the way states have changed it. They're making changes for new workers. Uh, this is opposite than the private sector, actually. In the private sector, because of federal rules and other incentives and research about how retirements are uh, impacting workers, we have lower vesting requirements than we used to in the past. We have higher enrollment rates. And because of the research and power of defaults, we have more and more plans that are using smart defaults to nudge workers into good retirement savings habits. Uh, across the country, the employer contribution rates have risen, and now they are 19% of the average teacher's uh, salary and compensation. So uh, about a fifth of their compensation is going to this deferred uh, compensation. As David mentioned, teachers don't see this. So this is off their record books. It's not on their paycheck. They don't know or appreciate how much is going to it. This slide here is looking at changes over time to New York State's contribution rates. And I want you to see two things from it. One is just extreme volatility. So it was above 20% in the early 1980s. It fell down to almost zero at the end of uh, the internet stock market boom. And now it's rising again. It's going to be 17.5% uh, this year. This has lots of impact on school district budgets. It's difficult to plan for this. It means that it's uh, volatile and it drives up their compensation costs. It also hits, uh, particularly now, in terms of 
giving any teachers raises. It makes them uh, make choices about whether they want to pay teachers more money, whether they want to hire more teachers, whether they want to invest in other services across the district. Uh, but most importantly, we don't think that the, the current systems are working for the vast majority of teachers. Um, so I'm going to show some slides about, about how that is impacting teachers uh, today. So first, just note that the teacher workforce has become more mobile. So if you asked a teacher in 1987, 88, how many years of experience they had, the most common answer you would hear was 15 years of experience. Uh, 2007, 2008, if you asked that same question to teachers, the most common answer you'd hear was one year, followed by two years, followed by three years. So the, the workforce has changed. There's been a slight update to that since then. Uh, with the recession, there's been a, a larger increase uh, in retention rates a little bit. And uh, so now, if you ask that question, it's about five years. But the point holds, the long-term trend for both teachers and the broader economy is to have shorter t tenures than we did in the past. But pension plans are heavily backloaded. They don't reflect this, uh, this change in turnover. And so uh, the pension plans, this is a pension wealth accrual curve, and it shows how much teachers gain in benefits over time. This is just a sample plan. Uh, there are others that have different spikes and different things, but this is a general trend that there's very little retirement savings for early and mid-career teachers, and uh, then the pension wealth spikes towards the normal retirement age that states determine, legislators determine, when the appro appropriate age for someone to retire is. And then actually, every year that a teacher continues working, that pension wealth actually declines, because it means that they're spending time uh, working when they could be retired, and so their pension wealth actually declines. Uh, unfortunately, the vast majority of teachers will actually fail to qualify for significant retirement benefits. Um, so there are uh, lots of different ways this happens, but in particular, I want to hit on three of them. The first is vesting requirements. A vesting requirement is how long a teacher needs to stay or a worker needs to stay in order to qualify for at least a minimum pension in retirement. Uh, most states set five years. There are 17 states that actually set 10-year vesting requirements, um, which means that they have to, teachers have to stay 10 years in order to qualify for any pension at all. So we've done estimates on this. We've looked at states' uh, turnover assumptions and how much teachers uh, turn over. And about half, half of all new teachers won't qualify for a pension at all. So when we're talking about pension security, half of teachers don't have one. The next thing that, that uh, states do is um, they set very minimal requirements, very minimal benefits for teachers for even their mid-career workers. The Urban Institute has estimated how long it takes a teacher to have a pension that's worth more than their own contributions plus the interest on those contributions. So what they found is that it takes 24 years in the median state for the pension to finally be worth more than their own benefits plus their interest. Uh, so 24 years, that is a very small percentage of the workforce that actually meets 24 years, let alone it goes beyond that level. And then they also, uh, pension plans exact penalties on anyone who tries to move across state lines. Uh, if, if a teacher works a 30-year career but splits it between two states, they can lose half to 75% of their pension wealth. Um, and, and this is true almost any state. There's, there's rules about cashing out on the front end, so moving, leaving a state. There's also rules and limitations on when you enter a state that restricts how much teachers can accrue in benefits. These uh, limitations and these uh, problems also make Social Security vitally important. So because it's a mobile workforce, uh, we think that Social Security is very important for all workers. Uh, Social Security is portable, it's inflation protected. As David said, it's, one of, it's the best uh, retirement plan that we have. And uh, Social Security covers about 160 million workers. 95% of workers heavily rely on Social Security in retirement. It's extremely important for their retirement. Unfortunately, about 6.5 million workers, including 1.2 million teachers, are not covered by Social Security. This varies by states, uh, but they have chosen not to offer their teachers Social Security, which means they're more dependent on their personal savings and their pension plan. So if their pension plan and their personal savings aren't providing enough retirement security, they don't have Social Security to fall back on. And uh, this varies by state, but um, large states like California, Illinois, don't provide teachers Social Security. The last point I want to make is just about the size of the workforce. So because uh, teachers are the largest class of college-educated workers, and we don't think they're providing sufficient benefits to those workers, it's a national problem, actually. So teachers are uh, a larger group of workers than registered nurses, uh, social workers, <coughs> lawyers, physicians, other groups that they're commonly compared to. Teachers are the largest class of workers. 
So uh, you can learn more about this by going to our website, uh, teacherpensions.org, or following us on Twitter. Uh, but I want to talk a couple things about solutions, since I've talked about the crisis question. Uh, so before I, I give up my time, I want to uh, talk about a couple things that we could do. The first, as I mentioned already, social security for all workers, I think, is vitally important. Um, I think the, the choice that David presented about 401ks versus uh, uh, defined benefit plans is somewhat of a false choice. Defined benefit plans might work in theory, but they're not working for the vast majority of workers. Also, the, um, if we're going to a new system, particularly for this important group of workers, we want to think about a smart way to develop it, and we wouldn't want to just adopt the worst practices, the cheapest practices of the 401k model. Um, there are other options. There's a cash balance plan, which provides a steady, uh, guaranteed stream of income. There's um, hybrid plans. The federal government used to have only a pension plan, did not participate in Social Security, did not have any other portable benefit. And in the 80s, it switched to a, a slightly less generous defined benefit, so it still had that guaranteed security, but it was uh, less risky, less, uh, less reliant on just that one thing. And they, had, uh, they also adopted a, cash, um, a defined contribution component, which called the TSP, which is very popular, has very low fees. It's a 401k style plan, but it has uh, very low fees that the federal government, all federal workers are eligible for. And it also has Social Security. So now all for federal workers have this three-legged stool to rely upon. Um, finally, I just wanted to say we could, we could have well-structured defined contribution plans with smart defaults, uh, encouraging workers to save, encouraging them to keep their assets in the plan, to annuitize once they leave, and to not cash out their benefits. Um, so the last point I'll make is just that pensions work fine. They're efficient for the workers who stay in the profession, but for everyone else, uh, they often leave them insecure uh, for retirement.